So welcome friends and their dear and, uh, dear and precious friends and brothers and sisters in Christ in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So today, once again, on a Saturday morning, we, we are uh, gathering here in fellowship to uh, celebrate our the joy of our salvation through our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what we've been studying in the book of Hebrews is faith in God, in uh, what he has done, in understanding that he has brought us so that we can know him. And by knowing him, we can have confidence in him. And now we're going to today finish off uh, in chapter 13 of the book of Hebrews. And uh, then, uh, you know, that'll conclude this study, which I think I'm going to uh, take some time maybe later this week and compress it into one summary of the whole study because it's been quite long. But I hope and pray that, you know, you've all been studying along and uh, that this has been... Uh, beneficial to you in your essentially the real benefit ultimately is to develop and grow in your faith in God and uh, build a better and stronger relationship with him which is the very purpose of our existence is to have a relationship a perfect love because love is the is the bond the perfect bond that can never be broken and that is the only safety we have in our relationship with God is to love him the way we, he loves us. And the only way to do that is to understand what that love is, which he has revealed to us by his spirit. And he has given us the knowledge of that love through his word. Okay. All right. So 13 verse 1. It says, let brotherly love continue. By the way, this word brotherly love in here is the word Philadelphia. Love, basically, phileo means love. And uh, Adelphos, I think, means brother. So it's like, you know, love for the brethren. Incidentally, the city of Philadelphia in the United States was named after, and there was one in Asia Minor to whom the letter uh, was written by Jesus in the book of Revelation. At least Jesus dictated to John and he wrote it down, was called Philadelphia. But, you know, of course, in this world where everything is upside down, at least in the 1970s and 80s, you know, Philadelphia used to be one of the most violent places in, uh, in the United States, you know, hardly a place of brotherly love. Okay. Then it says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers. And uh, that word entertain is the word to be hospitable. And again, you know, the world that we live in, it's like uh, we are so trained, even subconsciously. And I know I find myself doing that at times is where we are so wary of strangers and, and other people that, you know, it's really something we have to, we don't have that culture anymore, at least like, you know, in the most of the world nowadays where people are just willing to be hospitable and to help each other. You know, it's like every man for himself, dog eat dog is basically what the world is uh, is become more and more so even, you know, within my own lifetime. And, you know, that is also a fulfillment of prophecy because in the book of Timothy, we can read, you know, that men shall be lovers of themselves. And of course, that evidence of love for oneself is, very, is all over. Where, you know, everybody all day, people long, you know, they're taking selfies and posting their own videos. And, you know, basically that's... Uh, self-aggrandizement, uh, you know, like basically exalting of the self. And that is what the Bible tells us, you know, and in the process, you know, we don't, uh, we don't have time for others, each other even, and uh, especially not for strangers, people that we don't know personally, even people we know personally, you know, we hardly have time for them, let alone for strangers. But that's what the Bible is telling us, you know, be not forgetful or don't neglect you know, that this God will almost consider this to be a duty. And so, you know, we need to sometimes just step back from our busy, busy lives and uh, to uh, to think of those who are be, not, not just look within, but to look without and look outside and to see others and perhaps their afflictions or their needs, etc. And what the Bible is telling us here is be not forgetful to entertain, entertain strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. You know, angels are uh, 
are, are ministers of God. They're sent by God to do some, you know, uncertain to do uh, work for him involving here, this very earth, you know, angels are very active here because for one thing, as we read in Revelation, for example, you know, there's the angel that was holding the winds back, angel that was uh, basically, uh, you know, putting something in the sun and it was burning hotter. So they are definitely administrators in uh, the uh, in the administration, they're very active in the administration of God's creation, but they're also like we read about, you know, in Mary, for example, when uh, God sent uh, the angel Gabriel and also to Zechariah, the priest who was the father of John the Baptist, and many, many other instances, you know, to, to Gideon, you name it, like they are there basically acting as messengers for God, for men, towards men. And uh, that's what he's telling us, you know, that, hey, and they can appear in the form of man so that, you know, they cannot, uh, they can basically uh, appear in any form that they choose to and uh, that they are given to uh, you know, for that purpose. And they can look very much like us and, you know, one wouldn't be able to tell that this is an angel. And this is what you've been told here is, you know, that we should uh, not neglect because we might have, you know, we actually maybe having some interaction with an angel for whatever reason, which we won't find out until later on. Okay. And that is, you know, something which people, again, like they, they, they twist things as in this world, everything is twisted, you know, then they start praying to angels and looking for angels. That's not what the Bible is saying. It's just saying, be hospitable. Okay. Be kind, be compassionate towards other people. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. The bonds is, of course, like, you know, this word uh, specifically in this instance, I think it relates to imprisonment, a prisoner, a captive, a prisoner. And, you know, this is, of course, referring to the Apostle Paul, who was writing this letter, because he was so often in prison and in bonds. And he says, you know, like, hey, just because somebody is uh, suffering or being persecuted or being accused of certain things, you know, that may even end up, uh, they may even end up in prison or something you know, don't forget them. And in this world, you know, of course, like we gain, like we are conditioned to that, you know, if somebody is uh, is accused of something or gets charged, you know, as in, ends up in prison or something, you know, that is a person that uh, we would all shun. Okay, that is something we would uh, happen to us naturally, but that's not, you know, that the, the, these some of these people in the prison or whatever, they could be great men of God, like John, like Paul is, Paul was, and, you know, and that's something, again, we are told to recognize, to have discernment, to know the people of God so that in whatever their circumstances, whatever the condition is, wherever they happen to be, whether they are, you know, comfortable somewhere in their life or whether they are struggling or whether they're having some, kind of, you know, other issues and persecutions are coming, whether people, uh, the so-called church people are all calling them all kinds of, you know, like Jesus was always being called uh, all kinds of evil things. If that is happening, you know, we need to discern with the spirit of God as to because they're really this in this upside world or down world, you know, the good people are going to be called evil. And that's just there's so much so that, you know, they may even be ending up in prison. And that's again, this is an admonishment to us that you remember them that are in bonds, bonds as bound with them. <clears throat> you know, to feel, to have sympathy, to have compassion so that, you know, you basically feel what that person is going through. And uh, that only can happen when we have love and discernment as to who is godly and who is not. Remember that other bonds as bound with them and them that serve, suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. And then what that means here is that, you know, we are all in this world. We are all in this mortal flesh in this mortal body and you just because somebody may be suffering you know maybe adversity it could be the adversity of sickness and disease or it doesn't matter any kind of adversity or even financial hardship or something like that you know he says you know these are the things that are common to man anybody that's in a body these things that happen to them he said you know so don't just uh because somebody is going through something you know and you are not that you neglect them or you ignore them he said that is not a good thing to do but to actually also keep in mind that, you know, all these things can happen to you as well. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled. Okay, so again, like, you know, this is uh, 
it, it, this is telling you about relationships and the bed undefiled, meaning, you know, that yes, there are God approved bonds and relationships within the confines of which, you know, certain activities such as, you know, physical relations between a man and a woman are pure. That's what the word undefiled means. You know, they are pure. They are not like, uh, they, they, they would not be considered to be something which is impure or unholy. These are holy relationships that's between, between a man and a woman. So he says marriage is honorable. Like if, if a person that is married, that has a wife or a husband or whatever, it, it is something that God would consider to be honorable. It is not something that is uh, disreputable or, you know, something to be shunned. Like in a lot of these religions, like the Catholics and, you know, some other other Buddhists and stuff like that, that forbid their priests to marry. And that is not from God. He said, you know, yes, if you are married, you know, treat it like with honor and respect. And uh, that relationship is approved for God. He does not consider it to be defiled and to be unholy. And uh, even like when you have that relationship, yes, God has taught us, you know, in the Corinthians, for example, that yes, at certain times, a man and a woman should give themselves to prayer and fasting and refrain from uh, having relationships with, with each other. And uh, But nor under normal situations, there is nothing wrong with that. And God does not consider anything impure about that. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. This word whoremongers is a very interesting word in the Bible because it has a different meaning than most people think. Most people think of whores as uh, prostitutes, especially women, okay, who have to sell their body. But prostitution and whoremongering, especially from a big biblical perspective, are two different. They are two different words, and they have two different meanings, completely different meanings. For example, the whore of Babylon, it is not necessarily referring to a prostitute, but there's more to it than that. And I would like to, in, in this particular case, this whoremongers, this word is the word pornos, from which, of course, we get the word pornography. And, you know, that is the Greek word pornos, from which we get the word pornography, and, you know, it's specifically referred to like a male prostitute, as is said here. A man who prostitutes his body to another's lust and hire. I and mean, this was quite common in the old world. And it still is to a great degree in many parts of the world, which, you know, that uh, in Asia and everywhere else where uh, uh, this uh, prostitution by males, especially by, you know, young, young males was quite, quite common. Okay. And that is what it said. They were called sodomites. And uh, sodomites were like, you know, they did it in a ritualistic manner almost. And in certain parts of the world, this happens even now, where these, you know, young men, you know, sometimes like in their very early teens or something, they're made to dress up as women. And uh, uh, this is where this whole trans culture is not something new. It's only been newly introduced into the West and is being promoted very heavily here, but it has, it has gone on in many parts of the world for a long time. So that's what the reference was. But however, there is something more to this meaning, which I want to read for you. What a whore really is in the Bible is not somebody necessarily, like I said, a prostitute, like a woman who has to sell her body. And you know, like, I mean, when you three really think about it, Jesus knew a lot of these women who were like in that circumstance that, you know, they were that they were in 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 their past uh, before they knew him, they had to sell their body, etc. But in most cases, it is not something that a woman. The difference between a woman who's a prostitute and a whore, or a man who's a prostitute or a whore, is different. Some women, you know, who's forced into it. A lot of women who are prostitutes, you know, they are actually forced into it. They are not there by choice. They don't wake up one morning and, you know, as a career decision, you know, on uh, school when they say, what's your, what's your career choice? They say, okay, I'm going to be a prostitute. No, most circumstances, they're forced into it. And God loves those women. He has uh, those young girls, whatever, even the young boys that are forced into these situations. And he does not condemn them in any way, shape or form. But a whore, on the other hand, is somebody here. The real meaning of this word porno is we look at this Greek as G4205, and you look this in the word study dictionary, which I hope you guys can all see on the screen. Pornos means to sell. Okay. It is it is related to buying and selling. That is what the real meaning of this word is. Carry over, particularly as merchants, and then to sell. 
Okay? It is merchandising. So a whore is somebody that sells not maybe necessarily their body, but maybe even their soul that does something. Or a man, for example, who has to, you know, who, who, who really uh, flatters and does all kinds of evil things just to get ahead, to, you know, get promoted, to get a better job, to make more money, et cetera, to have a better career. You know, that is a whore. Whore is somebody who does something in this world for worldly gain. And, you know, it does not, it, it doesn't even have to involve the selling of the body. It's more related to the selling of the soul. The Greeks considered one who prostitutes Duted himself for gain as pornos. Okay. And that is, my dear friends, the real meaning of whore. A whore in the Bible, as opposed to a prostitute, is somebody who is selling their very being, their very soul, their very person, just so that they can get ahead and get gain in this world. This is, you know, it seems to be used in this sense, it seems to be used in 1 Corinthians 6:9. Or malakau. I want to talk about this word malakos a little bit. Okay. This word for, for no, fornicators, it's, it tells us here in this uh in this first Corinthians 6 9. That word means malakos. You know, like I used to work with some Greek people, some of some uh, Greek uh, uh in a restaurant, and you know, there's some Greeks, and they always use this word malakos, you know, and this word malakos had a very derogatory meaning, and basically it 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 implied that you know you are just a whore like even as a man that is, you know, selling himself for something. And that is what the meaning of the whore is, like the whore of Babylon. What does this tell us in Revelation 18? Does it tell us that it was just some kind of sexual sin or selling of the body? No, it was the selling. It was just merchandising. It's selling anything to get gain in this world. That's what a whore is. So a woman who may be married can still be a whore because, you know, she does not necessarily have married the man for love, you know, but for his money. That would make her a whore in God's eyes, okay? So it is not just prostitutes. So you got to keep that in mind. You know, the word in the Bible, the word whore, is not referring necessarily to uh, a woman or even a man who may be selling a body for like, you know, just to, for sustenance or something. It's more than that. It is a person who sells their very person for gain, for worldly gain. And adulterers, God will judge. Adulterers is again a word which is basically in this context is the word moikos, and it is G3432. And it really means someone who is faithless towards God, an adulterer who is faithless towards God, as we read in these definitions here. And you can read that in uh, James, you know, God's, God calls those people, you adulterers and adulteresses. So adultery in God's eye, yes, of course, there is, you know, uh, marriage adultery where a woman who may be married, you know, and uh, goes and have uh, relations with uh, another man or a man, you know, uh, who uh, goes and have relationships with a married woman or something like that. That is also adultery for sure. But in this context, again, it's more than just related, uh, uh, applicable applying to like physical relations, it applies to the person on their inside, their spiritual condition, where, you know, they do not have faith in God. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. And the word judge is to basically separate, essentially to uh, basically to, to, to put on trial. God will try, you know, as we read in, in, in the book of Revelation, you know, everybody's tried that they were judged by their works that they've done in this body. So God will judge. And the judgment, again, like I said, is, is more of a spiritual condition than necessarily that a physical condition that a person may find themselves in. And like I said, most people in this world who are actually like prostitutes or whatever, they are not necessarily doing that by choice. And most in the majority of situations, they're forced into it, especially, you know, young girls and women, but also in the case of many males, it happens. So those are not the people that God is condemning or speaking about in these, in these verses of scripture. They are more related to people whose spiritual condition is that who have given themselves over to the love of money so much that, you know, they have, they will do anything to, so to speak, to get ahead, ahead in this world. Let your conversation, this word conversation is, is, is your lifestyle, is the manner, 
in which you live. It's, you know, it's your daily life. That's what this word conversation, and it's not related to speaking or having a, you know, conversation with somebody as we generally use it. This word conversation in this here, it means how you live. So he said, let your conversation be without covetous, your manner of living, your lifestyle. Don't be covetous, okay? Don't let the lust of other things come in and destroy your faith. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. I think one of the greatest, best, one of the best ways to live in this life is to be content. And, you know, that is something in we as Christians have to learn because, you know, we are so conditioned even from birth to just to get ahead or, you know, our bodily needs to take such precedence that we are always seeking things. And that's what, you know, in the Bible it says, you know, having food and raiment or having food and clothing, let us be content therewith. So contentment doesn't require too many physical things and physical objects. Contentment requires a relationship with God. Let your conversation, your manner of living be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Yes, God may allow us to go through some testings and trials in this world so that, you know, we, uh, we may even lack many things. We may not have, uh, we may struggle to even to provide for us in this world, but that doesn't mean that God has left us or forsaken us because all those trials and those, uh, those tests that we have to go through, the purpose of those in the end is to make us holy, to train us, to condition us, to be good soldiers for Christ so that our faith can become stronger and stronger in him because it is not based on how many material things we have come to gain in this world. We don't judge God by the amount of things we possess. We judge him by understanding what he has done for us, that he has given us everything, including and up to and including his own life, as I've repeatedly said, especially in this study here. It's all through the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If a person gives you a life, what more can they give? So, But yet people are still looking for God to give them things so they can come to believe that he loves them. But that is not the evidence and proof of God's love. The evidence and proof of God's love is, is in the giving of his life because he gave you that which is most precious to him. And what more does he have left to give? Nothing. He's given it all to us already. And when we come to understand and believe that, that's when we really begin to love him and that develops into a relationship. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Man, yeah. The enemy, you know, Satan, we say, understand is the enemy. But in this world, really, the way the enemy Satan works is through men, through mankind, you know, through men or women, or whatever. Usually people that are very close to us, families, other acquaintances, friends, etc. You know, they are the ones that bring cause us a lot of pain and suffering and grief. And uh, that's just the condition of this world. So that's why the Bible tells us Psalm 40, uh, 27, you know, you can read that, you know, uh, the one host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war shall rise against me, and this will I be confident. One thing I desire of the Lord, that will I seek after. You know, that I may dwell in his temple all the days of my life, and that, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That's beautiful, right? To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. He said, Yeah, don't, don't, don't be, you know. Man is always going to be camping against you. Man is always going to be, you know, sending darts towards you. But if we are covered in faith, we have the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the feed shot for the preparation of the gospel, a peace having on the breastplate of righteousness, holding the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, then none of those darts of the wicked one can ever, which he throws at us through other people, are going to come and do us harm. Okay. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. 
So again, he's not just talking about the rule over you. He's not talking about you know your political leaders. He's talking about your spiritual leaders, people that you know bring you the food, that uh, give you feed you with the word of God and the truth of the word of God, that are uh, helping you in that help us in our growth, in our you know build our relationship with God through giving us the knowledge and understanding of God, and that's what he's saying. You know, treat them with respect. You know, have reverence for them that these people are God has appointed as teachers or, you know, in other possessions, uh, they deserve our respect and, you know, our whatever other way that we can benefit them and they deserve that. Remember them, this is what he's talking about, the rule over you. It is not talking about the political, you know, leadership of this world, which is all evil. Remember them, which are the rule over you who are spoken unto you. Who is the, the see, it's defines here, right? Rule over you, who? The ones who have spoken unto you the word of God. Whose faith follow? Considering the end of their conversation. He said, you know, let not your conversation be with covetousness, but let it be a conversation or a lifestyle or a manner of living of faith. And in that journey, people that, you know, who are helping you grow in your knowledge and understanding, you know, it only happens because, you know, there's some point in time they have exercised some faith, which has brought them that understanding and uh, follow that. Don't follow the world. Follow those who are following God. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Man, this we could go on for like days and years. Strange doctrines. They are everywhere. I guess they've always been with us, but especially in the end times. It says, you know, it's going to be get even worse where people are going to heap to themselves teachers having a cheers as we read in Timothy. Oh, that's already happened. Oh, most people in this world have itchy ears. That's why, you know, people like myself, they don't want to hear what I have to say because they want itchy ears. They want smooth words. And well, there's no shortage of teachers and teachers that, are, that, that, that will fulfill this itch of theirs, they'll come and scratch their itch, and in return, they'll give them, you know, funds and money and everything else. But you know what? In the end, we got to keep in mind that this body, this life here is but a vapor. We are just passing through. We are already like, you know, sun is risen, and this, the do that we are is already evaporating. So, you know, what do we want to have benefits in this life, which is already over? Or do we want to have lay up our treasures in heaven when we understand that and then we focus on that which is eternal, not on that which is temporal, then, you know, like the choice becomes quite easy. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them with are occupied therein. Oh, yeah, legalism, you know, even like uh keeping go keep the sabbath day and this and that don't do this do that don't do that eat this don't eat that you know those things are not gonna profit you if you're if you are possessed by god and you're obsessed with him then you know what you eat what you drink for you what you put you put like you know those things that really have no significance whatsoever because jesus already said that he's cleansed all meats you know whatever sold in the market he said you can eat it and don't just go and, you know, start freaking out that, you know, oh, I ate some pork today. Oh, my God, you know. No, nothing. There's not, the, the, the God is not condemning you for that whatsoever. He's not interested in what you're putting into your body. He is interested in what we are putting into our minds, into our hearts, into our souls. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is that word of God. You know, and that is that we have to put in. And where is the word of God? The word of God is in your King James Bible. That's where it is. So if you keep putting all these YouTube videos that people are preaching and teaching on, and, uh, you know, who knows what are these strange stories about the Nephilim or, you know, the Antichrist or all that here. Yeah, that, that, that those things are not going to profit you as we, as, uh, as it tells us here that these things, these diverse doctrines focused on, you know, bodily rules and rituals and everything else, they are not going to profit you. They are not going to make you grow spiritually. They are not going to build your faith and they are not going to help you in your relationship with God. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. 
So he said, if you're serving the body, you know, you don't have any right to eat of that spiritual food, which is only to be found inside the Holy of Holies. Okay. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Where for Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. See, what is telling us is that we have studied all through this year that those things, and this goes on till very this very day. You know, God gave us the Ten Commandments, but you know we are not capable of keeping the Ten Commandments. We are not even capable of keeping the first one. Forget the other nine. Okay, where people talk, well, you got to keep the Sabbath day. Well, you know what? God's commandments begin with, you shall have no other gods before me. And trust me, we all have had, and even to this day, we all do things which place other things, other people, other relationships, other obligations before God. And when we do that, we break that first commandment almost on a daily basis. So therefore, these rituals, these following legalisms, they cannot bring you to God. They cannot bring you inside that holy of holies where we need to go to be cleansed from all this. So Jesus came and he says, you know, okay, that all this that these priests have been doing, they've been sacrificing these animals and on the holy of holies, on the day of the atonement, uh, what they did is when they sacrificed the goat, you know, they had to take it and burn it outside the camp because, you know, that blood that was in there, they knew that it was not going to cleanse them from the inside. You know, that it was just going to do an atonement, which I explained to you is just a covering up for a short period of time until the next year when they had to do it all over again. And that's what Jesus, this is what he's talking about, that Jesus suffered outside the camp. He says, you know, this camp in which all these rituals had been practiced, there was not that Old Testament, that Old Covenant, it was not able to perfect people on the inside. So he was going to put an end to all that. For that purpose, he himself went and suffered outside so that his blood outside the camp could be brought within the veil, within the Holy of Holies, which is where God wants to be. We are the temple of the living God, we are told. But our inside has to be cleansed so God can come in there. And that blood had to be applied inside. Now, that was what happened here. And that's what he's talking about here is that, you know, those who are serving the tabernacle, all those things that they did, they only served the body. They only brought like a cleansing of the body. It had nothing to do with the cleansing of the soul of the spirit. Now our high priest was going to do a greater and better job. So he finished it once for all by offering the ultimate sacrifice. And for that purpose, he was taken outside that camp. He did not he was not sacrificed within that temple in Jerusalem. It was outside the gates that he had to go and do that. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Let us therefore go unto him outside the camp. And what that means here is bearing his reproach. Is that, you know, leave all that old behind. Leave that old man behind. Leave all those things that, you know, whether we came from a religious background where we were required to do this thing or that thing in order to make us worthy for God, none of those things work. So he says, you know, our high priest is not within where all this camp, where all these things go on. He says, which is the Old Testament, which is the Old Covenant, because this book is written to the Hebrews. He said, leave all of that and let's go out to him where he is so that we can be perfected on the inside. And when we do that, we are generally, as we are taught, that whoever will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You're going to be having, you're going to be reproached for it. And he says, okay, if that's what's going to happen, then uh, so be it. Let's go with him. Let's go to him. Let's leave all this aside. Let's leave the old man behind. Let's leave the old covenant behind. Let's leave all those old rituals and ceremonies behind because they have not been able to over, you know, thousand years or something. They have not been able to perfect us or whatever number of years that they were doing it. Yeah, probably a thousand or more years. He said, now let's see that which is eternal, that is going to bring us eternal salvation 
in a purge our conscience so that we can serve God because we serve him with our love now. We can serve our love to God because we have come to know that he did all this because he loves us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, which is himself, because he was himself that son in the body, which we've talked about a lot in this, in this teaching that, you know, God is the father, son of God is Jesus. They are two, yet they are one person. So that person, they suffered as one. Uh, so God the Father has suffered everything that the Son of God has suffered. He has suffered everything any creature of his has suffered. He has done it all because of his love for us. And now it's time for us to return that love to him. And then the purpose of creation will have been fulfilled. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come by which we have talked about, you know, a lot about this city in, in, the, in chapter 11 that, you know, these people are looking for. It's not on this earth, okay? I mean, you know, no, we look for it. We think, you know, if I leave this place and I'm, if I leave this relationship, this person, maybe another one's going to come. I mean, it's understandable that in some relationships that are really, really, you know, very, very uh, broken, that, you know, there's no possibility of reconciliation and fixing in certain situations, you know, when it's violent and abusive, it's, uh, it's, it's that relationship has to end. But for the most part, people, you know, have this imagination that if they're living with another person or if they're living in another place or if they had another job or if they travel to something, they will find fulfillment. But no, there's nothing. You can find some enjoyment, certainly, but not fulfillment. Fulfillment is not in this world. So we always have to be seeking something which we know doesn't exist here, which is that eternal continuing city, which is the new Jerusalem, which requires us to be new creatures in Christ, which requires that we put aside this old man and watch him wither and die and to grow in our faith, in our understanding, in our knowledge, in our love, in our relationship with God so that we are worthy of being given citizenship in that new Jerusalem. For we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God. So God no longer requires sacrifices of animals. Now, thank God for that, you know. I mean, just the thought of it going, I mean, it goes on all over the world today, where people still sacrifice animals all over, like uh, especially like in Muslim countries and, and other, you know, cultures, you know, but Man, like, you know, just the thought of that is like, you know, thank God that we don't have to do all that. What he requires of us is a sacrifice of praise. Can you praise somebody that you don't know? No. No, no, no. In this world, people are deceived, okay? They are deceived by the media, by everything, to look upon certain people as gods and to worship them and to offer them praise, whether it's the president or it's the pope or it's uh, some actor or some star or whatever. But we don't praise God. We don't sacrifice praise to him. We don't lift up our hands to him, sing to him, bow down before him because he demands it. It's because we know him, that he is worthy. Just like those 24 elders sitting around the throne of God that throw down their crowns before him, because they say, you are worthy. And they have come, they have first-hand knowledge of it. That's why they do it. And that's why we offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Yeah, we wake up here I'm looking out my window, the beautiful, you know, scenery that God has created and with some hills and mountains and lakes and water. You know, it's just so beautiful everywhere. And that's not just the beauty. His real beauty is the love that he has given us. And that's, my friends, is why we love him. But that's why we offer to him the sacrifice of, 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 of praise. Our lips are constantly thanks in everything. Give thanks to him because we know him. And we know that everything we have, it has come from him. And there is no other source for it, including the breath that I breathe. But to do good and to communicate, this word communicate means is to share, okay? Like if someone of uh, one has, you know, have been blessed in this world materially, he says share it because there's going to be plenty of people who, have, who don't have it. 
So, you know, don't, don't just hog everything for yourself. Don't be greedy and selfish and, you know, forget about all the others that also need and, uh, and uh, help your help and your, you know, that have worldly needs as we read again in the book of James. If somebody comes uh, to you who needs some help, who might need food, who might need some money, whatever, you know, then you tell them, oh, God bless you. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Take care of you. Go away now. You know, that's not, that's not love. And that's what he's telling us to do good and to communicate, forget not for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. And if you're sacrificing, God will consider that a sacrifice, which most cases for us, it isn't, you know, somebody asked me for like, you know, $5 or something, you know, like, I mean, that to me is not really going to be a sacrifice, but God will still look at that if it's done from your heart, it is done without any expectation of return. God says that that is a sacrifice that he is well pleased with. These are the sacrifices, God. And this is what the teaching to those Hebrews, which applies to us today is, hey, forget about those animal sacrifices. Forget about all these ritual things that you're required to do. No, the sacrifices that God de desires now, not demands, desires, is the sacrifice of praise, is to help each other, is to love one another. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Obey them. Again, he repeats that, that I rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Okay? And then in this world, you know, this church and everything is so broken too. Because people that should have the respect and the authority, they are criticized and they are reproached, just as Jesus and the apostles were, so there's nothing new there. And people that shouldn't, all these fake pastors and big evangelists and big, you know, whatever ministries, they are, or people submit themselves to these false teachers all the time. But if somebody that is a real man of God, they just basically want to boot him and have nothing to do with him. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourself for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do with the joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. Okay, so I mean, they are not doing it. They're not getting any kind of, you know, a big medal or some kind of, you know, man of the year award or something like that because they do it because like the apostle Paul said, you know, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. It's because this responsibility has been laid upon them by God and they take it seriously. And that is discernment. That is recognition for such people that are worthy of honor. And, uh, you know, but sadly, sadly, you know, people, not too many people are able to discern. Discernment is sorely lacking in the body of Christ today. Pray for us, for we trust that we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. Yes, and that is what, you know, we need to do, not to make merchandise of the word of God. And uh, even to help somebody, it is not done for some kind of, you know, gain or profit. It is done, everything is done out of love. Love for God first and foremost. But I beseech you rather to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. Again, like, you know, Apostle Paul writing to these Hebrews that, you know, yes, he's been in prison. He's been in bonds. He's been all kinds of evil things have been done to him. And he said, pray that I will be restored. And, you know, we can have like fellowship in person. And uh, that is what we need to do is to pray for each other that, you know, this fellowship that we are having will continue and that we will, we will be able to support each other spiritually so that we can all feed together spiritually and grow spiritually. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. See, again, he's repeating time and again, that this is the everlasting covenant. That old covenant was temporary. It was temporarily brought in to bring us to Christ. Christ has now come. The Messiah has come. His blood has been shed. We now have eternal salvation, eternal cleansing. Our holiness is being perfected. Love of God is being shed abroad in our hearts. So that's what we need to do. That, you know, now the, now the God of peace, the brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, 
that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect. Oh, I love that. Love that. Love that. Love that. That God is making us perfect. Be ye perfect as God is perfect. To have a perfect relationship with God, we have to be perfected. We have to be perfected in love. And, and, and that is, when I really think about it, it, it just, you know, it's my mind feels like it's going to explode. Like, you know, you see in those movies, you know, where something just blows up. That's how I feel like, you know, how is it even possible that God can make us, that we can love him as he loves us? See, that alone, that there's somebody that exists that is able to do that, that alone should be enough for us to fall down on our faces and never get off there. Because, you know, he has done this, which I think is the greatest thing that anyone can ever do is to make another person capable of love by giving them love first. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. So Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's ah, a wonderful prayer. And, you know, I would pray that for myself and for all of us, that the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make us all perfect in every good work to do his will, working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen and amen and amen. And I, brethren... And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I've written a letter to you in a few words. See, people don't want these kind of teachings. Like I said, they want smooth words. They don't want to sit down and spend the time going through the word of God, word by word. Right precept must be upon precept, line upon line. We read that in Isaiah. They don't want to do that. But I thank God for all of you and all of us who has God has put it in our heart that now, you know, we have started this fellowship with, with restudying the word of God, word by word, line by line, understanding precept upon precept, so that we don't just do like, you know, uh, uh, take something, one, one piece from here, one from there, put it out of context and come up with some kind of, some kind of doctrine, strange doctrine, which really has no profitability because it is not based on the truth of the word of God. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in a few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty. See, even Timothy suffered with, with, uh, with Paul. Timothy was like, you know, a young man who Paul considered to be his son. And, you know, but he had learned like father, like son. Timothy was a good son followed him even into prison and persecution. Know you that our brother Timothy is at a liberty whom if he comes shortly I was with whom if I if he comes shortly I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you. Most of us don't consider that you know God may have appointed somebody as a shepherd over us to guide us, to teach us, to lead us. And you know we all want to go our own way or do do our own things. But this year has been repeated the third time in this chapter. He says, salute all them that have the rule over you. But that is what God is looking, not just for the shepherds and the rulers that God has appointed to do their job, but for those who are the sheep to be able to recognize and to follow and to honor them as they should. Salute all them that have the rule over you, all the saints, they of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen and amen. Dear friends, that concludes our study in the book of Hebrews, which I think is one of the most important books in the Bible because it puts everything together as to the purposes and plans of God, what he did, that he, what he has done beginning so very long ago. And he has finally in, uh, in giving, in, in, in shedding the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, those plans have been brought to a fruition they have been completed, but there are certain aspects of it which are not yet revealed fully. They will be upon his second coming, and therefore we pray, come Lord Jesus, even so, come. Greetings, Paul. Thank you for uh, this fellowship time and your teaching that you give us. Um, 
a good chapter. Um, I wrote a few notes and um, let's see which ones I find the most valuable. Um, I'll, I'll kind of start backwards, if that's okay. Um, in Hebrews 13.22, I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in a few words. Uh, the definition of exhortation uh, is to an imploration, hortation, solace, comfort, consolate, exhortation, entreat. And then if you, there's also another reference to another one that, that's connected, which is pray. And, uh, you know, I think it's ironic that most churches today, they don't mind you coming, listening to their motivation, motivational speech. But um, when I grew up as a child, my mother went to hundreds of churches because she just wanted life. And she just, the thing she said when she was very young, when she first went to church, which I believe there was a time when even the 501c3 churches still had some, some you know, a few that were worthy of their time, I guess you'd say. And, um, yes, and absolutely. That, you know, that, that's something, although I condemn organized religion a great deal, but, you know, there's always people in there that are sincere and, you know, that really seek God. And, you know, in many cases, they have been hurt by those churches. You know, they have been really... Yeah. turned away from God, which is very evil. But, you know, yes, the, but I agree with you that, yeah, there were some good pastors too. And uh, maybe there still are some, you know, somewhere. Very rare. But yes, uh, I agree. But especially in those days, I think there were far more people that were still sincere and truly seeking God like your mother. Yeah. Yeah. And so the last thing I was going to add to that, thank you for um, expounding, um, was when she was younger, she used to tell me all the time, when I was younger, the pastor would come to my house and check to see if we have food. And because she was a single mother, she she said the pastor would always check them like he was family. And then she just said they don't do that anymore. They just you go in, you throw some money at them, they say something nice and put on a show, and then you walk out. And she, it just tore her heart up. And she finally figured out in the last few years that it was all just a scam. Um, I think that's the hardest feeling is when you become a Christian and you don't know better, but um, that's why we pray and ex exhort, you know, that's the one message I think that um, we, we need to exhort each other. We're too far away to be in person, but um, um, I think that's what God has showed me that it's a, like the brotherly love, which goes back to verse one. God has just showed me that if I don't have, if I don't exhort love as, more than everybody around me, then how can I be the light of God? How can I be a representation of the light of God? And, you know, um, two days ago, there was a, two people fighting a security guard and a, a delivery guy. And I got just said, go down there, get in between them. And I went down there and I just, I started <laughs> tearing up saying, why are you hitting your brother? Why are you hitting your brother like this? And the police were there. They're telling me to leave. But when they saw me like emotionally reacting, the, the police stepped back and let me talk to them. And and uh, I just told him, the police took him away, of course, but uh, I could tell him he was really affected by the, in the heart. And China, they don't have a lot of heart. The word love, the traditional symbol, has a symbol of the heart in the middle. And the new symbol, they just took out the heart. And uh, God has put me in a very heartless place to show me that if I don't have charity, which is an outward expression of love, not an inward, that we're just, we're, we're nothing. Um, I got many other notes, but I don't want to take up all the time. Um, thank you for this time. Oh, angels. Sorry, real quick. Um, don't, yeah, by entertaining angels. Um, you know, I don't expect people to believe me on their words. It's, it's, you have to pray about it and trust me, but, or not trust me, it's your choice. But I was very young. I used to have a heart disease and, uh, um, long, very long story short. Um, I had a man dressed in regular clothes at a church, ironically. Um, and there was a guy that traveled that he does ministering and healing. He was not very well known. And uh, a man in regular clothes walked up to me and touched me. And I felt, to the, I felt like, like I was kind of like a sci-fi movie. Like I felt zapped and like so my body changed and I fell to the ground. Went to the doctor. They said my heart condition was gone. Many years later, I talked with my mom like 15 years later about it. And she says, no man walked up to you. You just fell to the ground. So uh, I believe I saw an angel. Um, cause my mom was behind me when that happened. Um, anyway, I don't, like I said, you, you, people decide if they want to believe this, I'm just sharing it because it's very relatable. 
Thank you for the time, Paul. Um, I'll, I'll pass. The all right, Nathan, minutes. thank you very much. And, you know, God keep you safe over there. Uh, Jessica, please go ahead. Oh, I was very touched. Hi, Paul. Hello, everyone. I was very touched by what Nathan said. Um, and uh, also your teaching today um, hit everything <laughs> that I needed to know. That was amazing, Paul. Thank you. Um, I had a bit of a morning of it. Um, stopped at a petrol station. Um, there was a guy uh, hood up, you know, dodgy vehicle, dodgy, bullying the guy behind the counter. Now, this is five o'clock in the morning, so the shop is not open. They can only go. And he's going, hurry, hurry up, man, get my things, get my thing. And it was so frightening. I stepped back, watched this guy and waited for him to leave before I went to pay. Um, as I went to pay, I saw about five or six drops of blood the size of mandarins on the floor. I was signaling to this guy that there's blood on the floor. It might be connected to the vehicle that had just gone. Somebody needs to call some. Nobody wanted to do anything. Poor mm. everyone. Nobody wanted to help. All I kept thinking, I kept looking at this blood and thinking, good or bad, somebody has lost that. Somebody has right. lost that. And, 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 and I, I felt so sick. Then I thought that my supervisor at work, you know, again, this is five o'clock this morning. I thought my supervisor... All she was worried about was me getting the job done. I got the job done in record time. I went home and I still sat there thinking, how many people didn't help that blood on the floor? Not the person. The, 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 that's what I saw, the lifeline. The... <sighs> I'm sorry, everybody. You can see it's affected me. Um, and I'm sorry, Paul. But your, your teaching today about helping people, um, explaining the whoremonger thing as well, was a, a massive help to me. It's not my fault that other people don't want to help someone. It's my fault whether I help somebody or not. And uh, I thank, thank God for this meeting today because it's, I'm able to calm down, put things into perspective. I did what I could in this wicked, wicked world of turning a blind eye. Oh, thank you for listening, everyone. Amen. You know, and I think that's all God requires of us is to do what we are able to do. Of course, we're not going to fix this world. Everything is not going to, you know, but uh, maybe there might be one person that that we can help. That uh, that That's all that matters. Okay, Nathan, go ahead. I um, just wanted to add to that. Um, as uh, I'm not going to go into news, but it, uh, China, there's been like 25 protests in the last uh, beginning of the last month um, in China. And... Uh, People aren't protesting because of millions dying in hospitals. Like the hospitals are so full that they're literally putting people in the waiting room and outside in their cars and everywhere. I mean, the death toll here is, is unbelievable. Actually, if you study it, it's like the, the <laughs> uh, even rich people that are like officials can't find places to bury their, they can't, they can't burn the bodies because the, the waiting is like two weeks in some places. It's just crazy. It's like a, it's like a war zone and how many people are dying, but people are protesting because they're not getting paid, not because of the death. And it brought me back to that whoremongering, how people are more focused on money, the, the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. And no one's talking about, well, everybody's afraid to die, but no one's, no one's making a protest over it. And the only ones that I have are the children, ironically, the younger people. Um, just wanted to share that. And um, my advice is, no matter how wicked the world gets, we need to be like Christ and be like Christ when he was on the cross. Forgive those, forgive them, you know, bless our enemies. That is insane love. And no matter how bad it gets, we have to hold on to that understanding. Uh, thank you, Paul. Yes, agreed, agreed. You know, we kind of tend to become callous just living in this world, but uh, ultimately, what we need to do is to continue what we are doing so that we are continually transformed on the inside because only when love grows in us, then we don't have to think about helping people. We don't have to think about uh, entertaining strangers or being hospitable. These, these, that just becomes our nature because it's the nature of God. And that's whose nature we need to, our own nature, we need to replace it with his nature, with his person, with his being, and then we'll be able to do everything that God requires us to do. You know, just because we are no longer the old man, the old person, 
And that's something we all need to continue to work on. And uh, that requires, you know, study, prayer, relationship, fasting. That's what's required. All right, my dear friends. So we'll uh, gather together tomorrow at the same time. Uh, God willing, and uh, I you know, hope you have a blessed day, Jessica. You know, I pray you'll be, you know, just, uh, yes, I understand that these things can be very traumatic, but uh, let the peace of God reign in your heart. And, uh, you know, he, he, he knows you and sees you. And that's, uh, that's what we need to, is to look, see him and to understand him. Somewhere lost for eternity.